forward. So I'm just going to first um, make a quick reminder for, for the audience about how the session is going gonna, is gonna to be. So uh, we're going to have the, the talk of, of Andy. Uh, it's going to last about 30 minutes. So during this time, um, you can submit questions at any time using the uh, Q&A window, which should be, let me see my screen. Well, I cannot fit it in, but it should be in the, at the bottom of, of the window where you see us. Um, then you can vote. Uh, the, the questions, you can comment on them because they're going to be ranked in the window for me, um, depending on how popular they are. So then I will take the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, so I will just be uh, reading the questions to, to Andy and he can answer to you. Then that is going to last about 15 minutes after, after the talk. Um, then the Q&A session will end and the students who register for the student session, uh, you can stay. Uh, in, in on the call, and then you will probably be promoted to um, a panelist uh, uh, for, for, for the discussion afterwards. Then uh, the session, the recording will stop at that moment, and uh, then we will have the student session, but we can talk about that again uh, afterwards. So let me try to introduce you very quickly um, the, the topic and, and, and our speaker. So, um, I let Andy to give the, the, the really the, the real introduction about the, the, the science and, and, and predatory bacteria, but I wanted to give a very good uh, large overview about uh, what uh, predators are. And I was actually very naive because I went to uh, Google, like everyone does, and I type predator. And I was hoping to see a lion attacking a prey or something like that. And that was a bit frustrating. I, feel, I felt old because this is what came up. So I have no idea what this is. It was just the, all the, the hits at the beginning were this thing, whatever that is, um, Fortnite. So I just saw that. So that must be a video game or something like that. Uh, so I went through and no, nothing, you know, alien wallpaper, maybe Xenomorph. I thought, well, maybe Xenomorph is giving me, is going to tell me something about it, but nothing. You know, you have here a predator riding a Xenomorph cycle or a predator riding a Xenomorph Rex, uh, but nothing about uh predatory bacteria, which was our uh, interest today. So I decided to be a bit more specific for Google and I type uh, uh, animal, predator animal. Oh, sorry, that, anyway, uh, well, one slide went wrong. Uh, so then the hits were there. So here uh, we had a yeah, lion uh, attacking something. Here we have a crocodile attacking a buffalo, whatever that is. Um, so basically predation, as uh, shown in the slide, is a biological interaction where one organism, the predator, is going to kill and eat another organism, okay, which is called the prey. And in, uh, it is one of a family uh, of common feeding behaviors that includes parasitism and micropredation, which usually don't kill the host, or parasitoidism, which always does kill uh, uh, the, the host eventually. Uh, so then I wanted to be still a bit more specific and I typed predatory bacteria and here, here they, they were. Uh, we had loads of images. Actually, all the first hits are about Delobibrio. I think, Andy, uh, you're going to tell us about it mainly uh, today. And a predatory, uh, oh, here it was, my slide. A predatory bacteria actually uh, are tiny bacteria. Um, because they need to get into the host in general that feed, <clears throat> sorry, another bacteria. So some predatory bacteria can switch from predation uh, to feeding on other substances in the absence of their prey. These are facultative predators, but other depends on the prey. So they are obligate predators uh, for nutrients and for growth and, and development. So Andy has been uh, working on, on predatory bacteria uh, for, for a while. Uh, I'll just remind you a little bit his, his um, a career track because he's so modest that he gave a two line bio for announcing the, the, the talk. Um, so Andy did his PhD uh, in, he completed it in 2002 and in Birmingham. Then uh, he went uh, for a postdoc uh, to uh, Canada, to Vancouver, to the lab of Natalie Streda. And then he returned to Birmingham and he started his lab in 2010. And then ever since he's been focusing mainly on defining novel functions uh, in predatory uh, bacteria and signaling enzymes in Delobibri in particular. 
And these are actually very relevant uh, because of the antibacterial activities uh, that they have. Probably he's going to mention that in, in his introduction. And um, they're also very relevant for, for life inside uh, the host bacterium. So among other things, uh, Andy has discovered how interacting with prebacteria can cause a protein to do cycling nucleotide signaling uh, for downstream responses. He also showed how a protease immunity gene from another bacterium can evolve to protect a predator against its own cell wall enzymes. And uh, he also showed how lysosome can actually evolve uh, to recognize a different cell wall chemistry. So I've got the chance to know uh, Andy for a few years now. And um, not only actually he's an extraordinary human being, but he also uh, breaks, uh, breaks sorry, uh, new ground, I think, in virtually all what, uh, that he does. Uh, he's a great thinker. Um, he's a great mentor. He's a fantastic collaborator, I heard. Uh, he's a reader of science. And uh, he's a great exponent, actually, of protein structure determination, and also a very, very good speaker. Uh, I'm putting a bit of pressure on you now. <laughs> but uh, I have to say, and actually, with all my respect for structural biologists, because it's not because of them. It's just because my own limitations as a scientist. Um, it was by listening to one of Andy's talks uh, that it was the very first time where I really enjoyed uh, a talk by a structural biologist. Um, again, that's on me, uh, on, on my limitations. But uh, you know, when I hear yeah, tryptophan, whatever is changing to alanine, it, it doesn't provoke any emotion in me. But um, I think that Andy has the, the ability to bring really the bio, to make that accessible to, to all the people like me who, who, who are limited in structural biology and uh, really bring in, brings in the, the biology into, into his, his talks. Um, so um, what else can I say? I think that his work about Abdelo Bibrio has been done in, in collaboration uh, most of the time with Liz Socket at Nottingham uh, University. Uh, that is, I think, a very joyful uh, collaboration. And they have been uh, exploring together um, unknown biochemistry and uh, discovering new uh, biology together about uh, Delo Bibrio and uh, yeah, the predatory process into, into the, the host cells. Um, and yeah, it's actually quite striking. Every time I hear one of Elise's talks, uh, she always has super nice compliments uh, for Andy. And she emphasizes the relevance of his work to their studies. And, and then vice versa. When I hear one of Andy's talks, he always has, or in general, uh, a slide about Liz, and then um, uh, actually doing the, the, the very same comments, which makes us all a bit jealous about uh, that kind of collaboration, because I guess that's, that's not that common these days, and that's what we all uh, dream of, uh, in a way. Um, so then, um, I think in addition of um, his work um, uh, with Delo Bibrio, uh, and he has been tackling novel mechanisms in a range of protein processes, including lipid export, peptidoglycan recycling, um, then some enzyme function to cyclic nucleotide signaling and cell division. And I think he has been spreading his work to other organisms such as Mycobacterium, Mycococcus, and E. coli, at least. And he publishes very strongly uh, with his uh, structural biology discoveries and by solving novel functions of all these enzymes. He's trained uh, several graduate students, which I think, who are, think, sorry, are now uh, scientists in other major structural biology laboratories. And he got the YIP award in 2013. I think that was in the slide. No, it's not in the slide any longer. And uh, he's been recognized by uh, many funders, such as um, he got a Welcome Investigator and a DARPA Co-Investigator program grants uh, for the Delo Bibri work. And um, I think he was also a young investigator um, by the ICAAC of the US. And I think that's a great... Um, um, path <laughs> that uh, led him today uh, to share uh, his work with us. So I think um, that's it for now. I'll just uh, see you again when moderating the session. And I just leave the ground to, to Andy now. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I, have a, I have a lot to live up to now. So um, <laughs> fingers crossed that happens. I'm just going to share screen. Boom, boom.
pom, pom, pom. And hopefully that works for everyone. So uh, thank you, Ruth, for the lovely introduction, really warm introduction. Um, and also a massive thank you to EMBO. So, so becoming a YIP was transformative for me and it remains stimulatory and it remains easily one of the best things that's happened to me in science. So if anyone listening to this is considering uh, applying for it, strongly rec couldn't recommend it more. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to field those, but it's a massively positive process and it's a gift that keeps on giving, really. Um, so today, I'll tell you about predatory bacteria, I would hope. This comes in the form of a series of short vignettes. So the detail will be there of sorts, but I'll try and take you through the complete life cycle, really, of these fantastic bacteria. And in doing so, give you the different flavors in which evolution has adapted these remarkable organisms. Um, so as Ruth says in her introduction, when most people think about predators, your mind lapses into meat eaters. And, and here's our example of a fox hunting the rabbit. Whereas when we talk about micropredators, the scenario is often different. For example, big doesn't eat small, small eats big. Uh, and in terms of what I think about when I think about micropredators is, is I think about this, right? As, aside from the joke, I think about the tools and the mechanisms and the why and how uh, as, as, to, as to what predation enables these organisms to do and what enables them to do the predation. And so predation on the microscopic scale is, is fascinating, but this is the moment at which to, to firmly underline the fact that it's undercharacterized. So these systems are phenotypically really interesting, but they're undercharacterized at the molecular level. And so here I give you five predators. Uh, the prey cell's yellow, the predator is purple, on your screen. Um, the first example would be organisms that secrete antibiotics and enzymes onto their prey. Uh, and, and the best known example of this is Myxococcus, and it's a fantastic bacterium to study. It, it does a lot of things socially. It almost behaves like a multicellular organism. It has one of the most complex genomes we know in a bacterium. Uh, and, and it does all kinds of wonderful mathematically modelable motility forms, but essentially it kills the prey from the outside via contact. Uh, and our second mode of predation is, I'm going to show you in a minute, a fantastic new video of this. It's really evocative. So the predator sits on the outside of the prey cell and like a vampire, punctures the cell envelope and then sucks the products out. Um, so that, that's an epibiotic approach. Uh, the third one, which the majority of the talk is going to be on, is where our predator has the exclusive ability to reside within the periplasm of a gram-negative cell. So it has to enter the cell. And then once within it, it has a private dining room in which it can consume those nutrients without sharing them with the rest of the environment. So this is a really good adaptation if you want to be a very fit predator. Uh, our fourth mechanism is rather brutish, goes straight through both elements of the cell envelope and lands up in the, in the cytoplasm, and this is Daptobacter. And our fifth one is the newest discovered mechanism in which the predatory cell is enormous and engulfs the prey almost as if it was a eukaryote. And there may be some parallels in there genetically if you look between this predator and eukaryotic systems of engulfment. But whatever mechanism we're talking about, these organisms are natural tutors of microbial physiology. They tell us about microbes, about the structures involved in them. They're a source of novel biology because their genomes are just full of genes that are completely unique because these genes have evolved to fit these specific lifestyles. They're a source of useful biology because we could use them to kill other cells. And so in 2010, I sat at, set up my lab with, with, with the purpose of informing on how this happens. Um, and then the pitch to funders is, of course, this might be useful in, in agriculture, biofouling, medicine, infection, if we can understand how these predators kill their prey. Uh, here's some EMs of that. So there's a Vampyrococcus on the outside of prey there. There's a Della Vibrio inside the periplasm of prey in the middle. And on the right hand side is that Pac-Man like munching of prey by our phagocytic like predator, which is remarkable. Uh, so I promised a video of Vampyrococcus. This comes brand new courtesy of an article two months ago um, 
fabulous, fabulous article. And if I play the video, you see those inclusions in the prey, those yellow inclusions there, the predators on the outside, this darker. And, and what I want you to see from this video is how tightly attached it is. That prey is struggling and it's moving. And that here's one, let the predator attach to it, still remains attached, still remains attached. You can see the tiny cell on the outside latching on. And, and evolution has given it an incredibly strong adhesive link to its prey cell. So, I, I mean, I could watch that all day long. It's, it's really cool. But imagine if you were able to see that at the molecular level, at the point of interaction, there'd be all kinds of processes going on. Um, but I'm most interested in, in, in the predator Delavibrio and it has a very staged life cycle. And here you can see the Delavibrio cell in, in yellow, much smaller than the prey, um, and the prey cell, in this case E. coli, in, in blue and purple. And as I mentioned, it's very, very, very transitional lifestyle events. So, so our predator is free swimming, it can exist in the environment, it attaches to the outer membrane, then it makes a decision whether to, to go off, kill another cell, or whether to cut a hole in the outer membrane and pull itself through that hole. And that, that it, this event has to be very tight. So you can't just puncture the cell and the insides would rupture. It's a very tight attachment. It pulls itself through. And in doing so, it now resides in the periplasm. And this event occurs concurrently with the rod-shaped prey cell collapsing into a spherical structure called the deloplast. So our delavibrio in yellow is inside, our prey cell is collapsed into a sphere, more on that later, and then our predator cell grows into one great big long filament and then into any number of daughter cells. So this diversion away from binary fission allows you to make the most of the metabolites in that cell. You know, if you can make three daughters, you, you set tape the filament into three. If there's enough to make seven, seven odd, even it doesn't matter. It's a remarkable adaptation. And then those progeny lice the prey cell, the cycle takes three or four hours, uh, and the, the cycle can begin again. Uh, and here's some videos from my collaborator, Liz Sockets Labs. You can actually see this happening. Delibrio enters the prey, it rounds up. And then over time, you can watch it consume that cell from within. And in the bottom left of that video, the daughter cells will burst out, go on, and attack the cells on the right-hand side. Go on. Pop. And then what's remarkable about this is this is a pretty involved event. And it's hard to see what's going on inside. But um, Andy Fenton in Liz's lab made a fluorescent prey, and then that enables you to see a shadow of the predator within. So this bottom video, you can now see that cell division event. So the filament grows, it's consuming the prey cell, and all at once you'll see it divide into five progeny and pop the host. Um, and I'm very, very lucky to have Liz as a collaborator. She's a remarkable scientist. She's a Delavibrio pioneer. And some projects start with Liz and then come to our side of events. Some projects start with me and then come to Liz's side. Some projects ping back and forth. Um, and what you're gonna see in the examples I show you today um, is Liz's lab uh, covers the cell biology and the in vivo the genetic aspects of Delavibrio. And then my lab covers the protein function structure side. And together, I hope we can, I can convince you we make a good partnership that can explain the events uh, of this life cycle. Um, and so when you see those in vivo uh, examples, these come from Liz's lab, not my lab. Uh, and, and then we recycle the ideas between us and hopefully we can characterize this rather novel biology. Um, and so the first point here is, is, is sort of where I started in a way uh, in, in the lab. And this is my first PhD student, Richard. And Richard's um, project was to use structure to say something about the pipeline of events that occurs at the point of invasion. And our route into this was a mutant 
uh, generated by Laura Hobley in this lab, uh, where, where you knock out a diguanolate cyclase, and now those predators can kill. So this is a signaling event that, that controls killing. And if you look at, at, at the gene, there's a sensory domain, this FHA forkhead domain, there's an enzymatic domain, and the enzymatic domain, when activated by the sensor, cyclizes two molecules of GTP to make cyclic DiGMP. So if we could understand this protein, upstream of it is a stimulus that presumably results from interaction with prey. Downstream of it are all those events that are coupled to invasion and killing. So this is, this is a good point to start. Uh, uh, and Richard is a, a very adventurous, very clever scientist, and I, I'm going to show you the way in which he enabled us to understand this. Um, so initially, Richard got the structure of this DGCB, um, and we were disappointed in a way. And why were we disappointed? So the enzymatic domains are at the top here, and the sensory forehead domains are at the bottom. And the first thing you can see, hopefully, is the protein is dimeric and the top of the protein is symmetrical. The bottom of the sensory domains is shifted to the side. This is asymmetrical. And the enzymatic domain, which should be making, making cyclic DiGMP, has produced it in the E. coli we use to make the protein. But then the product of that diffuses out and binds in this pocket between the two dimers. And this is inhibitory because it couples the enzy enzyme sites back to front. So this is feedback inhibition and is known for other, other bacteria that use these enzymes. So, so we have an inhibitory state of the active site at the top and the sensor down the bottom, where it would normally bind stimulus, which is known from eukaryotic biology, where these proteins are used in a completely different context, uh, these bind a phosphopeptide. And so if I color the phosphopeptide binding sites in purple, you notice that each one blocks the other. So the enzyme is in a dead state, the sensor is in a dead state, and Richard and I were disappointed. But sometimes with things like this, it's what you don't see. And what we didn't see was a 30 amino acid tail which should have preceded the sensory domain. And so Richard, being remarkably on the ball, said, what if, that tail is disordered and is actually the substrate, is actually the phosphopeptide substrate that activates the sensor, that activates the enzyme. So this is a pretty big jump to make. So in most cases of systems that use these protein domains in other contexts, you would assume a phosphoprotein comes in, protein X, activates our forked sensory domain that sits down here, and then would activate the enzyme. And so instead of scenario one, what Richard was postulating was the tail that we don't observe in the structure is the substrate. A kinase phosphorylates the tail. That then flips over the sensor and turns the enzyme on. And if Richard is right, this gives us a bit of a window because firstly, we don't need to identify the kinase, which would be some pretty hard biochemistry and biology. And secondly, we wouldn't need to identify protein X. It's all contained within the same protein. So what Richard did was express the protein without the tail and purchase the tail as a commercial phosphopeptide and say, now do you bind self, do you bind sensor? And luckily for us, he was right. <laughs> so here's the structure of that sensory domain, it's colored electrostatically. If you turn this 90 degrees, you can see that the tail in yellow makes exquisite contacts to the forehead region of our enzyme. And the centerpiece of that is this phosphothreonine making all these interactions. So this is circumstantial evidence. And what we needed to know was that this tail sensor interaction was relevant physiologically. And so I spotted the residue before our phosphothreonine is a serine. And a residue I'm not showing you on the sensor is also a serine, and they're next door to each other. And I annoy the lab endlessly by suggesting disulfide coupling of any project that comes through the doors. But this is perfect. If you disulfide coupled the tail to the sensor, you wouldn't need to phosphorylate it, you wouldn't need to find the kinase, and you could turn the enzyme on artificially. 
And you could prove this is what kickstarts invasion. Um, so, so Richard made that construct. The tail is disulfide bonded to the sensor. This changes the orientation of the enzymatic domain, and this produces the signaling molecule that would initiate invasion. And so if we take a, a control protein from another bacterium, this produces psychic DiGMP as, as the graph migrates downward. And if we mutate one of Rich's residues to cysteine in orange, it flatlines, it's not making the product. If we mutate both to lock the tail in place, it goes through the roof. So we were able to prove using this disulfide methodology that the way that Della Vibrio initiates invasion is by phosphorylation of the tail of this cyclic DiGMP producing gene. And at the point at which we were thinking about this, we looked at every protein in every organism in Uniprot that had a fork head sensor coupled to a GGDEF. And if you sort these via size, only one of these has a gene fusion event. It fuses a sensor to a kinase, to the tail, to the sensor, to the enzyme. So in other words, this kinase that we're looking for in this other organism exists as part of, of a fused protein. And if we look at what turns that kinase on, it's a protein that's widespread in bi biology that's never been investigated. So what I think might be happening here is Della Vibrio has taken uh, a sensor that has a ubiquitous role, maybe mechanosensing in other bacteria, and has licensed it to activate this pathway. Um, if we take this synthase and we do a pull down, we find hydrolase, so we can now have an idea that it prevents futile cycles by binding the very protein that, that terminates this signaling. Um, so this is more invasion biology. Um, also, to completely switch track now, I sort of give you several vignettes. Um, it's very important for the predator when it gets inside the prey to perform a series of manipulations. And a lot of these manipulations center on peptidoglycan. Um, so way back in 1978, when I was one, I date myself there, um, Thomas Shaw and Rittenberg did very elegant biochemistry to show that the prey cell wall, which is comprised of these sugars represented by hexagons and these cross links represented by squares, a vast swathe of modifications occurred to prey peptidoglycan because you're shaping that cell as you're invading. Um, the third amino acid was rearranged to a position we don't know about. The backbone of the cell wall is cut, the side links are cut, the sugars are deacetylated, and remarkably, the cell wall is isolated by a lipid. So all these different modifications going on to allow our predator to now exist within the periplasm of another cell. Um, and this was cut, the understanding of this was lacking a, a few years ago. Um, and Tom Lerner in Liz's lab suggested that this event where, where the rod shaped prey gets invaded and spheroplasts into a round cell, he suggested this was due to two enzymes present, known in a transcript, tran, transcriptomic study from the lab that were homologous to each other. And making a knockout in Della Vibrio is very difficult. And what Tom had to do here was prove his hypothesis was right and make a double knockout of these two genes and show that if he, that if he, could, if he could get a phenotype from this, these might be the proteins responsible for this morphological change of the prey cell. And luckily Tom was right. And a double knockout of these two genes leaves your predator inside the prey, which is no longer chain shape, it remains rod shaped. And, and for years, the field thought that this rod to round conversion was about giving a nice space for your progeny to develop. And, and Tom could show that wasn't the case. And remarkably, if you look at this cell, another Della Vibrio enters. So the shape change conversion is an occupancy signal. It's an adaptation. It's telling other Della Vibrio, I'm inside this cell, go away. So it's about fitness. And so uh, my lab decided to uh, take this project on in collaboration with Liz and see if we could use structural biology to inform on the adaptation present in these enzymes. Um, 
and, and rather fortunately, this tells you something about the evolution of predators. So on the right is E. coli PBP4, which is used um, in growth, in regular, in regular, good old regular E. coli. It makes, it makes a cut in the cell wall material and synthases come in and they add their material and the cell grows. And that cut has to be rather minimal. So in other words, this domain in orange is inhibitory in a, in a fashion, um, and it prevents excessive cutting uh, by the active site uh, shown here in this white domain. And what Della Vibrio has done through means of adaptation is remove the inhibition of this enzyme by switching out the orange domain for a completely separate, completely different structure here with two helices. It's made the active site look bigger. It's made the protein more stable with an extension of the C terminus. And so it's taken a protein normally used for growth and repurposed it to round and spheroplast prey. So it's quite a nice evolutionary adaptation of, of a regular enzyme. Um, and this is a lovely story. And, and, and then it progresses on a bit more uh, when we publish this and you get a comment, well, what, what prevents the Della Vibrio when it's using these rounded enzymes, what prevents it from attacking itself? It's got its own cell wall. And the, and the most obvious answer is a protein that inhibits this rounding activity itself. And what's wonderful about this is eight nucleotides away is a candidate for this. So there's two of these rounding enzymes, eight nucleotides away from one of them is something postulated to be an anchorin. And anchorins are enriched in intracellular bacteria of eukaryotes. So here we would have it in an intracell intracellular bacterium of a prokaryote. Uh, and we would want that to inhibit this activity in self. And so structural biology again, um, the anchorin is in blue and our enzyme is the same colors. And clearly that active site at, at the white there has been occluded now by this repetitive fold in blue that just clamps on has to inhibit two proteins, and here's it inhibiting the second in the yellow and blue diagram on the right. And then best phenotype ever, uh, Carrie Lambert, and this is lab knocked out this immunity protein, the complex uh, two structures, and, and Della Vibrio sidles up to prey, and if you knock out the protective gene, poof, it spheroplasts itself and dies. So it's a nice, again, it's a nice adaptation in that the immunity protein here is inhibiting two other proteins. It's not that one-to-one -one ratio you see in toxin antitoxins in other systems. Likewise, uh, Thomas Scholl and Rittenberg saw that the cell wall material of the prey cell was deacetylated. The predator cell wall material is not. So you end up with another protection mechanism here by chemically making a different material in the cell you're attacking than the cell that you are. So in other words, the Della Vibrio inside has normal peptidoglycan and, and the prey peptidoglycan is deacetylated. And this comes courtesy of this enzyme here that has a little plug on it. Um, and, and peptidoglycan deacetylation is most common in gram-positive pathogens when they want to ev evade lysozyme. So they deacetylate their own cell and that makes them resistant to human mucosal lysozyme. Um, and so this story can lead now, hopefully, uh, to rewriting something we know about the most studied enzyme class, really, in all of biochemistry, lysozymes. So what would we need? So our predator uses this enzyme here to generate deacetylated prey in purple. It remains acetylated in, in orange. Um, and so what you would need at the point of which you want to burst out, you would need to take advantage of this by making a lysozyme that could attack deacetylated material and leave yourself intact. Um, the problem with this is in decades of studying lysozymes, there's never been a lysozyme whose activity, they always work on cell wall, always work on cell wall substrate with particular chemistry. So this question becomes, how do you find a different lysozyme? Uh, and, and this is the work of, of Chris, Hannah, uh, Pat here at Birmingham, Rob and um, Simona, uh, who's, who's 
who's now uh, independent, and they all came together and asked the question, can we find um, a new lysosome? And if you look for homology, you can see lysosome-like proteins, but, the, but, but when in the cycle they're made differs. And this candidate, BDO314, is made at the precisely the right moment. Three hours into the life cycle, this expression of this turns on. And so this is a really good candidate. But you're studying it blind. You're just saying that it's good because it's made at the right time point. So you take a chance on this. And, and Chris in our lab, Chris Hardin, uh, he, he had to make a fusion protein. This thing's toxic to E. coli for reasons we don't understand. Um, but we really want to understand its specificity. Um, so when I told co-workers in the building, I was trying to get the structure of lysozyme, they look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, this is the first structure ever solved. <laughs> like, no, it's a different lysozyme. And then we try and use structures of existing lysozymes to solve our structure, this doesn't work. So now instead of thinking I'm crazy, they think I'm competent. But as I'm gonna show you, this is because the fold has changed. Um, and so we use sulfur phasing, we got one angst on that. And here is our putative exit enzyme whose chemistry has been changed. First glance, it looks like a lysozyme, yes. You've got a, a big lobe at the top, you've got a cleft in the middle, you've got a jaw domain underneath. Um, and if you compare it to human lysozyme, it's, this is one for the, for the true, sorry, Root, uh, after you said structure nerds don't quite do it. This is one for the true structure nerds. Compare it to human lysozyme in blue. The active site residues are, are, are demarked here by asterisks. So it shares one at the end of a helix. So human lysozyme there, our exit enzyme from Delibrio there. It moves the second catalytic acidic residue to a different position on the fold. It changes the, the beta sheet nature of the floor underneath the cleft. It keeps one disulfide in the same place there and there. It shuffles the others. And then every single element that goes around the active site cleft is subtly changed. So this is why we can solve it via molecular replacement with other lysozyme structures. Like this helix is longer. These four helices are all new. This element's twisted. And so what evolution is doing here, and we're gonna see why it's doing it in a minute, it's repurposing all the elements that surround the active site cleft. Um, and, and through collaboration with Pat here in Birmingham, we could start an assay for this now because we know the deacetylase. So we can take fluorescent cell wall, pre-treat it with that deacetylase identified earlier, and then pool it into two different fractions, acetate positive, acetate negative, and test our enzymes. So normal hen egg white lysozyme in green really does not like it when you deacetylate the material. This doesn't run to completion. So, so this measurement here, should be down here if it did, but it really doesn't like deacetylation. A mutanolysin, which is a completely different type of enzyme, but works on the same kind of substrates, this doesn't care. But luckily, our exit enzyme in blue is massively specific for deacetylated material. If we, those two residues were identified the side of the cleft, if you mutate them, the enzyme's dead. You can find homologs, and again, each one, blue, red, and green, is massively specific for deacetylated material. Um, we can now find these in other bacteria that aren't predators. Um, and you know what? Maybe, maybe, if you're lucky, you could use one of these to lyse those pathogens of the eye, these gram-positive cells that deacetylate their own material to be lysozyme resistant. Um, so what are all those things doing? Here's the cleft with the substrate, um, unfortunately modeled in, not, not experimentally substrate complex, but lysozymes are pretty well characterized for substrate interactions. The sugars of the cell wall, uh, N-acetyl glucosamine in green, N-acetyl muramic acid in blue. And because every other sugar of peptidoglycan has a, has a peptide component attached, they have to face out of the cleft. So anything that faces in is the other sugar, is the NAG in green. So there's one NAG residue there, 
one there and one there. And all those reshuffling events in our exit enzyme allow two loops to come in to migrate towards the cleft. One in purple here and one in orange here. What do those two loops do? They sterically clash with the acetate groups of the NAG sugar. So what evolution has done is repurposed all the elements on the side of the cleft, grown the enzyme loops into the cleft at the two sites in which you would have ripped those chemical groups off at the start of the predatory life cycle. So this is how our enzyme has evolved to recognize a completely different substrate, even when it belongs in the same family as others. Um, rather quickly, if I can, some other projects that are, that are ongoing in the lab. Um, this is our most recent PhD uh, student, Viva coming uh, next month, Hannah. And Hannah's project is completely different again. So Hannah's project is to tackle this statement from the 70s, uh, that Della Vibrio really weren't seen to be chemotactic towards elements you might associate with prey cells. So this end statement here, uh, the data indicate that Della Vibrio do not use chemotaxis to locate prey. But hopefully, what you, what you can establish from, from listening to me wave my hands and blabber is that evolution wants predation in this regard uh, to be maximally fit. So I'm sure that Della Vibrio do use chemotaxis in a way to locate prey cells. And so Hannah's project is the Liam Neeson project. If you're familiar with the movie Taken, I will find you and I will kill you. And so what the predators do with chemotaxis to find um, molecules that might be associated with prey cells. And so the basis for Hannah's project is if you look at the genome, there's 22 chemoreceptors in there, which is enough uh, to be convinced they're using them in, in the correct fashion. Uh, and, and one paper by uh, the Kaduri group that used transposon mutagenesis and found a fitness deficit in a chemoreceptor gene. So in other words, um, mutation within this TLPA led to a predator that had compromised ability to kill biofilms. And so when I sold this project to Hannah, I said, what if, because we're making our proteins in E. coli, which is prey, what if they pull their ligand with them? You know, we could get lucky here. And so if we express these proteins and solve the structures, do are we, or if they don't pull their ligand with them, can we model it? Can we work out the contribution of chemotaxis? And, and here's a tomogram from the Jensen lab where you can clearly see chemotaxis receptors near the Del Vibrio flagellum. And so Hannah was pretty much successful right away. We, we, we took the protein from that gene that was identified in the transposon study. We solved the structure of this uh, and, and we've taken the transmembrane and the methylation domains off. So what we're looking at here is the exposed part. And you've got a dimer with a central long alpha helical core. You've got one cup at the top, one cup at the bottom. And inside the top cup, which is usually the protein domain that binds ligands and chemotaxis receptors, we see the molecule cadaverin. And this is the molecule that gives cadavers, dead bodies, their smell. So five carbons uh, and two nitrogens. And it's in this real cage-like pocket. You can see the density for it's excellent. And this is co-purified from E. coli. So this tells us the ligand for, for this essential chemoreceptor is a polyamine, cadaverin. There's a gene next door to this. So Hannah solved the structure of that. And lo and behold, this binds a related molecule, putrescin. So this is the same molecule, but lacking one carbon. And what's remarkable about, about this structurally is these two bind them in totally different orientations. So, so the pocket doesn't just, you know, shuffle a bit and, and bind something with one carbon less. So like cadaverin binds top to bottom, putrescin binds left to right, and these two genes sit in a two gene operon. So why on earth have predators evolved to recognize these molecules? So here's some data from the literature about putrescine distribution in gram positives, which are not prey, and gram negatives that are. So putrescine 
is pretty much gram negative specific. Cadaverin is pretty much gram negative specific. And these other two polyamines at the bottom and So this is a molecule present almost exclusively in prey. And so if Delavibrio was chasing a molecule that was present in all cells, it might not follow a prey. But what we might have here, and we're in the early days uh, of, of working this story out, what you might have is a scenario where one predator damages the first cell to send a social signal via these molecules to other predators to say, this is a site of successful killing. So it might be a social molecule rather than a chase, uh, a regular chemotactic molecule. Uh, very quickly, very quickly, very quickly. Um, I'm always asked about how do predators adhere to prey. Here is a tail spike protein um, of, of the O antigen of viruses. So this is P22 virus. This recognizes in green the O antigen in yellow. And this is what allows the viruses to recognize the gram negative surface of its prey. Uh, and, and through some trickery I won't describe here, you find this protein in Della Vibrio that is homologous to phage. It's remarkable. So it might be a similar system for the recognition of surfaces. This is the, the last 200 amino acids of the protein, so it will be fairly exposed on the predator. Structurally analogous to these phage receptors for O antigens, so obviously you would have to test specificity of that. There are 20 of these in the Della Vibrio genome. So you could have specificity to very, very different ligands. Um, and without, I'm not saying we're gonna solve all 20. These are really complex proteins, but as a proof of principle, we can solve another one, which looks like this. So the tail of it has two repeats. So repeat one here that looks TS tape phage tail spike like repeat, tail uh, phage tail spike repeat two, and this completely novel domain the end, which looks like a plunger. So these things now have become a sort of a, a, a pet project for us to ask the question, have predators taken these genes from phage for the purposes of prey recognition? Uh, maybe I'm allowed 30 seconds. Um, there's all other kinds of biology that fascinates me. So Rebecca in the lab is working on an outer membrane protein of Della Vibrio that ends up in the inner membrane of prey, which is crazy. Like inner membrane proteins are inner membrane proteins, outer membrane proteins are outer membrane proteins. This switches environment. And maybe that would be for the purposes of, of permeabilizing the prey cell. Who knows, but it's a very specific event that's certainly worth characterizing. Um, Hannah, um, her second project uh, with us in the lab was, we love gene duplication. There are 20 of, of, of these family members in Della Vibrio. They have one DNA binding domain via homology at the N terminus. They have a second at the C terminus. And not many proteins in biology do this modularity. You know, usually there's another domain that's a regulator or, you know, why, why have two DNA binding domains in the same protein? Who knows what? So the practical question would be what processes are these regulating? The philosophical question is why would you make 20 divergent uh, transcription factor-like proteins? And so Hannah solved the structure of this. It had proteolized down to just 50 amino acids, but rather luckily for, oh God, we're lucky. These 50 amino acids are the DNA recognition element in the second DNA binding domain. So it's a tetramer in Hannah's structure and the readout helix that binds in the groove of DNA, because it's a tetramer, there are two on the front and two on the back. And again, this is, Structural biology wise, this is completely unique. Normally you'd have one DNA binding interface. And so if you model how this would bind DNA, because these readout helices are present in all other structures, just not in this orientation, you get this amazing crossover effect 
where one double helix is bound to the front, one to the back, and you would be involved in almost DNA looping and condensation. So this is a bit of a mystery for us now. What are the specificity of these 20? Are they involved in looping and binding really condensed regions of DNA? Um, predators are enriched for novel folds and novel biology. Uh, and, and so we take this quite seriously and, and submit our structures to CASP, which works on the rules of protein folding, because you can see, look at what on earth is this structure doing at the top left? It's the bane of my life, tiny body, two massive abs. Um, likewise, we can solve E. coli proteins in predators. This is a metabolic hub enzyme. And when you take its um, allosteric regulator out, the enzymes rotate round like propellers. It's, it's really very cool. So predators are a good tool, not just to study predatory biology, but to study all processes really. Um, and I have overrun, for which I apologize, but I'm more than happy to take any questions. And I'd like to thank all these people for their hard work, especially like to, to thank Liz's lab, who are just a source of wonderment, uh, and also Pat for his work on the Lysozyme project and these funders here. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. So I'm opening the Q&A box and I see no question for the moment. They may be thinking about them. <laughs> So Andy, one, one question actually, are there predator bacteria? I should know that, I guess, but in, for gram positive. Um, gram positives, yeah. So some of, some of the ones I mentioned that um, deposit enzymes and deposit um, oh, the Mexico. They, yeah. They're really effective against gram positives with, due to their exposure without the outer membrane. Um, but yeah, and even Della Vibrio, in a way, will secrete enough nasties to, to take out a gram positive, maybe not specifically, which is it's hard to say, are you being specific about what you kill or not? But there, there are certainly, where nature provides a meal, evolution will allow somebody, I, I guess I need the Jurassic Park quote, where life finds a way. But wherever there's something to be eaten, I, I, I think the potential is there for it to be eaten, really. Um, and, and quite often it's making a distinction between something that is maybe a little parasit parasitic or, or things that can switch their lifestyle, you know. I, I, a lot of the examples I give there are where predation is, is key to their lifestyle, where, where they're um, obligate predators. Or, um, but I think, yeah, I think maybe even gram-positive predation might even be more common in a way. We believe because of that need to <clears throat> not deal with the outer membrane. Actually, I, I was thinking. I mean, I, I spotted the gram positive. You had two hits for the cadaverin production, um, and then I was wondering. Well, my, my two questions are like, what is cadaverin? Maybe you mentioned it, I misses, and I missed it. Sorry, but why is cadaverin produced in the first place mm. by these gram negative species? And yeah. and then. Who are these gram positive producing cadavering? So there's a, I, I have to, every time we switch focus, I have to re educate myself on something new. So when we hit this project, I was like, I could get myself a very good polyamine review. And these things are massive. So you read a polyamine review, they're involved in everything. They're involved in DNA packaging, envelope integrity. Um, and, and in E. coli, one of their main roles is in acid stress. So as soon as the cells are stressed in some way, they start producing cadaverin. And they use it, they do so by a decarboxylating amino acids. Um, but the good thing about where they're found is they provide integrity between the wall and the membrane. And so that is obviously going to be compromised when a Della Vibrio attacks a prey. Um, and then the other place you find them uh, is in yeast, and in yeast extract contains these molecules. And that original paper from 1978 actually found that predators were chemotactic towards yeast extracts. So that's maybe because of the cadaverin within, within them. Um, we did play devil's advocate because the shape of that electron density is the same as a molecule 
that's that's present as a plasticizer in the labware that we use. Mm -hmm. So instead of the nitrogens, it would have two oxygens, it would be C5O, two oxygens. And um, so we, we've used now a better assay to show that this truly is cadaverin in, in our electron density. Um, and of course, having a related molecule in the receptor next door kind of really adds weight to that observation. Uh, so you've got a sort of two gene operon responsible for the wider field of, of chemicals. But it's still an open question as to, is it attractive? Is it repulsive? Like chemotaxis is harder than I thought to pin down. Um, so I don't want to tie myself to an answer on that, but it would be lovely if it was a social signal that comes from a successful killing event. So I think it, you'd be a lot more successful as a predator recruiting to sites of successful killing. Sure. Right, thanks. So Andy, uh, yeah, we have a few questions now and I see the time, so I'm, I'm gonna go uh, to those. So we have a question from, from Andrea uh, Dessen. Um, hi, Andrea. <laughs> uh, uh, so she's wondering uh, whether you believe that there are proteins from the bacterial elongation complex that are also involved in this um, rod to a spherical uh, shape conversion in this process. Um, so th this, because of the strength of the, of the, of the two gene knockout phenotype, this is undoubtedly just down to those two rounded enzymes. Um, I think the wider question, which is interesting, is what can the host, host cell, prey cell do um, in response, which, which seems to, you know, it seems that it can't do it. Um, and cell wall-wise, I think quite a lot of the activities made by predators are there to circumvent any response that would be, for example, um, lytic, autolytic. So what the predator doesn't want to do is for the prey cell to undergo autolysis through metabolizing its own cell wall. So there's some other activities which I didn't speak about that probably counter that. And, and the two rounding enzymes act early on. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that rounding event is independent of anything else, but there are other activities going on. There's 3-3 three, three cross-linked formation, there's acylation, deacetylation, um, DAP rearrangement. So position three gets taken off, put somewhere else. Um, so it's hard because quite, quite often you can only study these processes one at a time. Whereas what you really should be doing is throwing all the enzymes in a single pot and, and letting their activities overlap. Great, thanks. So we have another question from Corey then. So hi, Corey. <laughs> um, so he says, great talk as usual. And um, so his question is this, does, is, does the class of DNA binding proteins that you have characterized have something to do with the odd number of cells that are generated in the host? You know, maybe a, a weird way of partitioning chromosomes. Yeah, uh, oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, if so, then why there are 20 flavors of it mm -hmm. kind of escapes me. But I mean, that, that question escapes me anyway, right? I, I'm trying to think of a good reason for 20 flavors of it. But when you see the DNA bound like that, or, or modeled to be bound like that, should bind in that way, right? Every other DNA protein does that. Um, that might be relevant to the fact that with predators in a tiny cell with the same chromosome size as prey, that like the chromosomes highly compacted and maybe that plays a role because you know, quite often it's hard to make a differentiation between the transcription factor and the nucleoid protein and, and maybe you know maybe these have an element of organization of the nucleoid about them who, who knows sorry i'm so open-ended <laughs> thanks uh so another question from algirdas mixes Sorry if my pronunciation was not correct. Um, so wonderful thing, uh, wonderful talk. Um, so is it known how the division is organized in Del Bibrio, uh, in, in what he, uh, what is called the serpent, I mean, this filamentous um, uh, cell after it invades? So, because yeah, the FTSZ rings and turns seem to be hard to, to, to place probably in this twisted cell. Yeah, um, so I mean, uh, without really knowing 
what the specifics are. You can ask, you know, what similarities do you have to other bugs? And maybe it's as a similarity to filamentous growth and division. You know, so we have a div 4A, for example, um, there's no knock. Um, but it, I find it hard for it to say how you make two, how you make three, four, five, six, seven. So maybe the principle is physical. Maybe your cell is so small and the genome is so big that you can't do anything other than line them up in a row. And, and maybe the septum forms when there's a gap between aligned daughter chromosomes. Who knows? Uh, it's not known to answer your question, but maybe physical principles have to dominate because of the size here. You know, you don't have much freedom other, other than positioning them. Um, all the the form at once. And if something isn't dividing, so, sorry, blah, blah, blah. If something is in, in, in the process of dividing and then another one comes in, then that seems to respond to it. So maybe there's a diffusible factor element to it as well that's uncharacterized. Because is the division process synchronized? I mean, do, do all the daughter cells just check? Yeah. They, they, they separate at the all, same time. Yeah, all, all form at once. Um, I mean, it'd be, it'd be pretty interesting to manipulate that and to mm. ask questions about that. But at the moment, it's, it's, it's not known and it's not massively inferable from looking just at the genome and comparing it to known division systems of other bacteria. It's a good, it's a good thing to study though. And, and have you visualized FTSZ, for example, localization in the Delobibri inviting um, cell? I mean, Is that That's probably a, question, probably a question for Liz. For Liz. I, I know uh, she has uh, papers looking at uh, power proteins. Um, yeah. That, but I think, I think it's really still a mystery as to, but it's definitely, uh, evolutionary adaptation to allow you to make the most of where you are. And there's, I mean, there's all kinds of Trojan horse experiments you could do to mess with it. But I think the question then would be, are, are you really observing something real? Because obviously you've perturbed it. Sure. Okay, so we have three more questions and then we'll just um, uh, go to the student session. So uh, we have another one. Um, Oh, so uh, yeah, fantastic answer. Thank you very much. That's what the person who asked the question is answering. Um, so we have a question from Amanda Fottenhauer, um, who wonders how specific are the predator pre relationships with this strain or other strains of Delobibrio? So you focused on E. coli, but are there lessons that can be learned about pre recognition to apply to other gram negatives? Definitely, that's a great question. So we're working with the probably the best characterized strain hd100 which comes from soil and so its relationship to e coli you know that's probably not that you know that natural a substrate for it um and then some strains of della vibrio bring that prey range right down almost to one and it's it, it pertains to the environment they're isolated in so for example, one strain of Della Vibrio being isolated from a, from a thermal spring in the Himalayas, there's only a limited amount of bacteria in that thermal spring, its prey range is narrow. Whereas HD100 I just spoke about comes from soil where God knows what variability and versatility is in there. So its prey range is broad. So it always depends on where you isolate it from. And, and as to, to answer your question to whether that then pertains to an interaction, whatever, predator prey system you're looking at, you would not want that to be compromised by simple mutation. So it's not like phage where they have one receptor and you mutate that receptor and oh my God, you've got phage resistance. There must be a multiplicity of recognition events. And, and, and the project I described with the tail spike like proteins, you know, even if you knocked all 20 out, right, are, are you gonna see everything? So you have to be very realistic in that, evolution will, will have over-engineered this. Uh, yeah, so you have to, maybe maybe biochemically is better in this regard, maybe not. I was actually wondering, uh, Andy, are, is, is there Delobibrio? Um, I mean, is it found in the microbiome? Yeah, uh, yeah. and it's, it's enriched sometimes in, in individuals that are compromised in, in certain ways. Um, and I think one study found it was more common in the young. 
Um, and certainly, right, there's a potential here if we understand, maybe not just Delo, but other predators, to, to do some microbiome engineering. Uh, so if anyone wants to, to, to give me a ridiculous amount of money <laughs> to, st to study microbiome engineering, um, I'm not sure, I'm, you know, I, and again, uh, it has to have a very controlled rate of killing, you know, almost farming the prey in a way. It doesn't want to over eradicate the prey. Uh, it's very balanced lifestyle, very adapted. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can you can use some tricks to make it more aggressive, um, but manipulating prey rates would be a big challenge. Yeah, because this can be used, I guess. Well, there are works about that, right? As alternatives to antibiotics. I think sometimes you know you you can you can say the enzymes, an enzyme preparation might be more useful in wholesale. Um, one of the things is when when Delavibrio kills prey one of the questions to answer is uh, how how much material is left and, and, and certainly in the terms of um killing infections you know how immunogenic is that material and can you manipulate that can you manipulate that relationship for example Okay, so the two last questions, we have a question for Vasil, um, who found your, your talk very interesting. Do you know if these uh, peptidoglycan sorry, modifying enzymes work in epibiotic delobibrio? Can we predict that from the genome? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, obviously, things that, uh, that live in the periplasm have to sculpt it in other ways. But there are peptidoglycan modifiers in the epibiotics, and, and sometimes they're there. Um, so I, I didn't show this, but Liz has a fabulous fluorescent peptidoglycan paper where they see, through monitoring the activity of LD transpeptidases, that a ring is made, a collar is made around the point of invasion. And the reason for this is think about like when you're a kid and you pop a balloon. If you put a bit of sellotape over the balloon, you can pierce it with a pin and it doesn't burst. And so analogous to that, these enzymes lay down a collar, presumably so the zone of, of lysis and pore formation is localized and doesn't compromise the integrity of the whole cell. So certainly there are peptidoglycan modifications in epibiotics, but are there as many as in those that live in the periplasm? No, because part of the role of those enzymes is to stabilize the invaded cell. That you're jostling about it. Great, thanks. So, last question from Yuri uh, Raphael. Great talk. Uh, so, uh, the question is: Are there secreted factors that avoid host self-killing in the case of those intracellular predators? Oh, sorry. Are there are there secreted factors that avoid host self-killing? Secreted factors. Oh, so what is the host able to secrete factors or are there other factors secreted by predators that that, that, avoid, that help them avoid killing themselves hmm. is that can, can you confirm whether the whether those proteins come from prey or predator and then, and then i can answer i could, maybe, I could, I could maybe. answer both questions so can, uh, can you be more specific uh, yuri he wrote no, secreted by predators. Oh, oh. sorry. Yeah. Um, so did, oh, there, sorry. Yeah, I missed it. <laughs> are there other facts? So we don't know why predators don't spend a lot of time killing each other. I mean, you can introduce Delo to Mixo and have them fight, yes. Uh, but the question I think you're answering is why do they not attack one another? Maybe that's a consequence of the fact they have different lipid chemistry. That, that, that's out there in the literature. They, they dephosphorylate their lipid A, to perform all manner of modifications. They have unusual lipids themselves. Um, but in terms of real immunity, that protein that was secreted to block self-rounding has four homologs in the genome. So even though we don't know what they're protecting against, we know that they're there. So that's almost interesting science in reverse, right? Now we know the protein fold used for immunity. We could potentially use that in reverse to find the activity they're protecting against in, in a pull down. 
There, there's certainly all kinds of self modifications that we're unaware of. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think we're going to end here the, the Q and A session so that we stick to time. We're we're not doing that bad. Um, so I think uh, Rita, you you want to say something? You, you're going to stop recording at this stage, I think. Yes, um, I'm going to stop recording and we can move now into the student session. Um, so thank you to everyone for asking your questions and um, students who, who registered can feel free to stay on and um, chat a little bit more with Ruth and Andy.